Hey everybody, and congratulations on making it through the first section of this RTS tutorial series. I'd really like to thank the people who have given me feedback on what they want to see in the series, what's worked for them, and what hasn't worked for them. I'd also like to acknowledge the 25 new subscribers we have to the channel from this RTS tutorial series, and thank them for their um, subscriptions, and letting me know that I'm bringing them content they value. So, in this section, we went over movement. In the next section, we're going to go over game time and setting up the UI and HUDs. But we're going to focus on this section, of course. So what we've done is we have set up our workflow in the very first uh, video and our camera as well in that video. In the second video, we did our movement forwards and backwards as well as our left and right movement, which we then iterated again in our fifth video. In the third one, we set up our zoom and reset. In the fourth, our pan and the pan reset. And then, as I said, in the fifth one, we you know fixed the issues with movement based off pan and zooming. We then set up our edge scrolling and camera speeds. Actually, sorry, the camera speed is part of that iteration video in the fifth one. And finally, we set up our map boundaries. So what we're going to do in this video today is just go over all of that code really quickly so that you have a kind of an overview of what we've done and why we have done it. One thing that I will have uh, forgot to have mentioned in that next part of this video is how we got the cursor to show up. And we did that inside of the player controller by setting display cursor and setting it to hand. I am sorry for skipping that. Anyway, load up the UE4 editor and we'll take a look at the code we have created for the, from this section. To be clear, I am recording this after recording the first lesson for the second section, so there'll be some things that are slightly different in terms of the files I have on screen than as when you will be coming to this video itself, which is right after we complete the first section. So you won't have this library file. You can ignore it for now. You will have that when uh, we get into that second section. So let's start with our player. We've created two new blueprints, which are our camera pawn and our controller. Our camera pond just houses our camera and our controller and has the movement controls for that camera. These both are activated by the third blueprint we created, which is in our game settings. You're not going to have the game state, so you can ignore this. But in our game mode, we set our, well, as you'll see in the next video, I forget to set game state, which causes a whole bunch of issues. So when I start having issues, my code doesn't work. Remember before I do to set the system to use it. So we set our controller class to our uh, pawn, sorry, our controller, and we set our default pawn to our pawn. So let's take a look at our pawn, see what we did there. So we really don't need the event graph. In fact, actually, you know, you can delete these. I haven't. We don't need our construct script or construction script. We just need to take a look in our viewport. And what we've done is we've put a sphere here, and this sphere is the sort of root component of the scene. We've scaled it down. We've made it, well, it's already movable. We've given it a custom setup in terms of collision where it will ignore everything except our map boundaries, which will prevent it from going outside the map. We've attached a spring arm, which we have set to 100, uh, say 1,500 units long. We have turned off collision test and we have set its rotation to negative 70, giving us that nice little angle there. And finally, we've just plugged a camera in at the top. If you ran into issues where when you plug your camera in, this red line and you know is pointing straight out this way, and that's blue part, you know the uh, Z axis is pointing straight up. What's happened is it's combating the rotation of the spring arm and you just need to set your rotation to zero, it will take the direction of the spring arm and it will point downwards. That's all we've really done here. Oh, and we've added the floating pawn movement, which is a component that adds functionality to this, uh, to this blueprint, but does not add anything else. I'm gonna anchor that in there. And then we have our controller. So when our controller fires up, We'll have more on the sequence, don't worry. If you've been following the videos the entire time, we did have a bit here that we've removed. 
the first thing it will do is it will get our references, which is a macro that we've created. So we go to our reference cast. Right now, all it is doing is it's getting the player pawn, it's casting to our blueprint for it, and it's setting a new variable as a reference to this cast. That way, we don't have to keep casting to the pawn every time we need to, you know, to do something with it. We have put this at the very start, so it's the first thing it does, and it will always, always be there. And then after that, we have our movement control. So we have our move forward and our move right. It gets disabled if the uh, user is panning the camera, because it just looks weird, I think, if it's moving and panning. And if, it is dis if the camera is not disabled, so it's false, it will move. And if we look at our movement controls, what's happening here is, you know, we tell it to go forward on, by hitting W. It takes that information, takes the input uh, axis value, which is 1, multiplies it by our default movement speed, which we have set to 15, I believe. I'm going to double check that. And default movement speed is indeed 15. It will then multiply that by our modifier, which will be a 1, so no modification, or a 2. I believe I'm going to double check what I said in a second. Um, which will then give us our x, fact, or x axis um, value for making our vector. So that is the mount we want to move forward. We also need to know where the pawn currently is and the direction it is facing. And that's what this set of code here does. We get our current transformation. We get our direction. We get all the current information. And we're going to take this new value, this new movement, and that is the way in which it's going to... That's Sorry, we're going to take that new value, and we're going to add it to our current location. We're going to move in that direction. We're going to leave the rotation the same, so that if we have... Uh, pan slightly, the rotation is now based on the pan. We're going to take that, and this is where we get our sort of, you know, this is where you want to go bit. Unfortunately, because what we're really moving is that um, sphere, we need to anchor the sphere. So we need to anchor it, and what we do here is we anchor it. So we take the value of where we want it to go, we're going to break it. We don't care about rotation or scale, we are not doing anything with these. We care about its location. We don't we aren't setting it here. It's been set here because we're making the transfer we're making it here. Here we are limiting it. We don't need to limit the x. We want to be able to move in that direction. We don't want to limit the y cuz again, we want to be able to move in that direction. And someone might hold down W and D to get at that diagonal. So we want both of these to work. However, the user is not going to be moving the sphere up and down. They'll zoom in and out. So we limit it this. We limit how, where the sphere is at. So at all times, the sphere will be at a 200 units uh, on the Z axis. We chose 200 units because that made the sphere appear above the ground of our map. It goes into here as our new location, and the sphere will then move that direction. We have sweep on because we want to be able to have a collision with our map boundaries. And we have pretty much the same thing over here, except we have a reverse on how this happens. First, we need to multiply our movement modifier and our default speed, and take that value and multiply it by the access value for y. And then again, we're just going to set our y value to that. All we need to get is where it's currently at and its current rotation, which we get here. We don't need to limit it because when we move in this direction, the sphere won't move through the ground. So we can just plug it in for our new location. Again, we want sweep. We can close this one out. And then our movement modifier is 1 and 2, like I said earlier. So if the user presses the sh presses and holds the shift key, they'll double their movement speed. Once they release the shift key, it goes back to normal. In terms of edge scroll, so when the mouse is on the top of the screen, bottom, left, or right, again, we check if movement's disabled, because we don't want someone panning and to you know, move the mouse to the left and start scrolling that way as they're panning. That wasn't what they intended to do. And 
we go in here, we can see we get the size of the, uh, sorry, the location of the mouse and the size of the viewport. Remember, this is a 2D space as compared to a 3D conceptualization. So instead of having Z, Y, or Z, X, Y, however you want to visualize that, we only have Y and uh, X. Because of that difference, we have to reverse our X and Ys. And again, as I went over in the video, you know, instead of crossing the pins, I could have taken this and plugged it down here and taken this one and plugged it up here. There are a few ways to have done this. So once we get the size of the screen, we use that as our absolute value, as 100%. And then we take the location and we divide the location in X by the size in X and the location in Y by the size in Y. This gives us the proportion of the screen covered. Again, remember, we fill the screen from the top to the bottom. So this is zero and this is 100 down here at the bottom. Likewise, for left and right, the left is zero, the right is 100. Middle of the screen towards the top would be zero in the X proportion, but 50 in the Y proportion. Middle, myth, middle, middle will be 50, 50. And at 2.5% um, of the screen covered, or sorry, less than 2.5% of the screen covered, or greater than 97.5% of the screen covered, which means that 2.5% remains uncovered on the opposite edge, we will have a, we'll begin to move the camera. So if you're up here at the very top of your screen, that is two point, that's less than 2.5% of the screen covered. If you're already here at the bottom, that is more than 97.5% covered, meaning there is less than 2.5% remaining at the bottom. Same for your X and Y. Anything in the middle of those values, nothing happens, which is what happens when we have that double false. So we first check, you know, are we at the edges, so very bottom or the far right? If, if so, then we want to move. If not, check are we on the very top or the very left? If so, then we want to move. If neither, don't move. And as I said, we have to reverse the bit of code here because of the difference between the world we're playing in and the object on which we are viewing that world. Let's close this out. Ooh, not that, sorry. Let's close this out. And so that takes us through our movement. Our zoom works by moving the spring arm, which for those of you who work in cameras, yep, it isn't really zoom because we aren't changing the focal length. We are changing the distance the camera is from the action. So what we do is we get the current location, sorry, once someone tries to zoom in or out, we get the current location of the spring arm or the current length of that location, sorry. And we take our zoom speed, which we have set to a default of 150, and we either add that if we're zooming out so the spring arm becomes longer or subtract it from the spring arm so the spring arm becomes shorter if we're zooming in. That value is then passed through a clamp, which prevents it from becoming uh, prevents it from zooming in closer than the minimum zoom limit you set, which I believe we have, actually I don't remember what our min zoom limit is, so let me double check, it's 300, and prevents you from zooming out more than your max limit, which we have set to 4,000. It then sets the target arm length to that, and then we reset it just by holding down our mouse, uh, middle mouse button and our control key, and it sets it back to the default length. In terms of pan, very much the same idea, except for now that when we start pan, it will automatically set a disable on the camera. When we start it, it opens a gate. It will then look for movement in the mouse on x-axis and y-axis. It will take that and multiply it by our pan speed, which I believe again is, oh, it's five. I was gonna say it's 10. Um, it will take that and it will get the current y if it's in the y-axis, or Z if it's in the X axis, because remember again, 2D space, 3D action, and it will add the new value that it gets here or here to the current value for those particular 
uh, parts of the, rota uh, the rotation. We will clamp it in the y-axis to prevent issues from occurring. There are different numbers you can put here. Um, I, I recommend experimenting around and seeing how these values actually work. And then it will make our new rotation. Our reset, again, will reset everything except for our pitch, which we don't want to change. You can if you want. It just sets it back to the default view. You know, sometimes I think a user might want to change the angle they're at, look at something, but be facing a particular direction. Leaving it like this is useful. So that takes us through our move, sorry, our movement controls. In terms of anything else we've done, our setup has been including our map boundaries. Oop, that's the sky blueprint I just clicked on. There we go. Which were made of blocking volumes, which we set as a special object type known as map boundaries. And we set it to block everything except visibility. And finally, the other changes we made, we can find in our project settings. In our project settings, if you go down to collision, you'll find we put map, this is where we created our map boundaries with a default responsive block. If we go down to our input, you will find all the inputs we've included, which is our zoom in, zoom out, our zoom reset, our pan, our pan reset, and our speed modifier. We also have our forward movement and right movement in our uh, access mappings. And don't think we've done anything else here. I just want to double check. We haven't done anything in navigation. Nope, we haven't. And we haven't done anything in physics. Again, no, we haven't. Sometimes I do things a little bit earlier on than I mean to. What we have done that I have not talked about is told the system overall to always use our default game mode. When you do this, we check that you know it actually put the right values in. Again, you're not going to have game state yet, so don't worry about that. You'll have it in the next video. So that's pretty much everything we did in the first section. I realize I went over this in about 15 minutes as compared to the, I think, th four hours that the earlier videos are take. Um, yes, I realize it's relatively simple stuff we did that I spent a long time banging on about. The reason why I spent that long of a time banging on about it was simply, I wanted you guys to understand why we were doing what we are doing. Getting the camera set up, you can take that and put it into other games and other systems. Um, so hopefully the first section's been useful. I hope you join us on the second section. I look forward to seeing you there.